we'll uh, continue with the uh, discussion of um, low carbon steels. So um, we had um, discussed the fact that when it comes to uh, formable low carbon steels are basically two, two groups of, of materials, the uh, interstitial free steels, which are uh, titanium or titanium and niobium alloyed, and the so-called aluminum killed low carbon steels. Uh, and we'd already discussed the, the big advantage of the IF steels is that they were robust uh, uh, steel concepts in the, in the sense that very little sensitivity to small variations in the process. Uh, and, and that was not the case in, in, uh, for the aluminum killed low carbon steels. Uh, as a consequence of extremely low carbon content, nitrogen content, the IF steel, we also have better formability. All right. So, um, and so whereas the, uh, the, the carbon content in the, low, in the low carbon steels was of the order of a few hundred ppms of carbon, uh, 200 to 500 ppm. In the case of the uh, IF steels, we're dealing with uh, carbon and nitrogen contents which are very low because uh, of the uh, vacuum treatment in secondary metallurgy, uh, that's point number one. And second, we also know that there is absence of interstitials because the interstitials are, are stabilized as uh, titanium carbide in the case of the so-called titanium IF steels and in the case of the titanium niobium IF steels, the um, carbon is stabilized as niobium carbide and of course in both cases uh, the titanium stabilizes the nitrogen. Okay, and you can see that the amounts of uh, titanium and niobium that are typically added are, um, well this is a very wide range, 100 to uh, 1100 ppm, typically uh, and, and, and 50 to 400 ppm niobium, but typically uh, we're talking about 200 to uh, uh, 300 ppm additions. Hmm? Okay, and uh, the IF steels are very soft materials because there's, you know, there's really nothing to strengthen them, and as a consequence, we do have extremely low yield strengths, which, which are less than uh, 200 uh, megapascal and can be as low as um, you know, 140, 130 if the material is not or uh, very little uh, temporal. However, very formable steels, very long elongations, slightly higher strain hardening, and uh, in terms of the, the R values, we, you know, we get values that are very close to two, uh, and um, so that means excellent formability. All right, so we discussed um, uh, on Monday the, the way that the, uh, the, this precipitation sequence uh, happens, uh, and I also told you that uh, in these steels there is the opportunity to stabilize the, the carbon at high temperature by formation of the carbosulfide. And although this works in practice, uh, it's not often used. It's, it's good to know it's not often used because it requires operating your slab reheating furnace at lower temperatures. Yes? And, uh, and typically a plant will want to have the slab reheating furnace running at one single temperature in operation. So uh, sometimes uh, good ideas don't fly because of technical uh, considerations. Okay, um, the uh, 
uh, calculations of how much titanium you have to add, uh, how much niobium you have to add. It's basically uh, simply based on solubility yes? uh, considerations, um, which, uh, which derive from uh, our solubility uh, products that we discussed. So for instance here, you see uh, in um, the, the, the solubility product for titanium nitride, titanium carbide as a function of the temperature. So here we have high temperature and to the right we decrease the temperature. So you go from liquid to delta ferrite to austenite to uh, uh, ferrite. So what, first of all, very important, uh, we see that the nitride of titanium is very low solubility uh, in, uh, in general in comparison to the titanium carbide. Uh, uh, both in the, in, the, in the ferrite and in the austenite. And the other thing you, s you see is that if you would uh, continue the lines, solubility lines of the austenite a little bit, yes, yes, you find also that the solubility of the carbides and the nitrites is dramatically drops when you go, when you, you have the phase transformation. Okay, uh, and so it can very well be that um, precipitates that are in solution in austenite, yes, will suddenly and very rapidly uh, precipitate after the transformation. Hmm? Uh, this is solubility for titanium carbide, for titanium nitride, here for titanium sulfide in austenite and the carbosulfide in austenite. Um, you see. Uh, there are many lines. There's not one single line. Uh, these solubility products uh, have been studied by uh, many people. We, we know whereabouts uh, uh, the solubility product must lie, but we don't know precisely. So in general, um, when you use these uh, solubility products, it gives you an indication of uh, what the... Uh, Solubility temperature will be, uh, for instance, uh, but you always need to, you know, make sure by uh, tests that that's actually the case, hmm? uh, because these are um, high temperature tests, and uh, they tend to be, uh, as a consequence, uh, more difficult to perform. Hmm? Right. So um, in this part of the the, the course, you, this, you may have noticed there are lots of tables. Uh, of course, it's not the idea that you um, uh, read all of these tables or, um, or, or learn anything from them. Um, it's for, your ref you know, for reference material if you, if you later work in steel-related industries or uh, do research in these areas. Um, it's interesting, however, to, to, to you know, have a quick look through these tables. So, um, Obviously, uh, in the industry, these grades exist. They've been developed. They're commercially available. So, and uh, when, uh, for instance, a car company or uh, uh, orders, uh, you know, this many tons of uh, steel uh, from a, a steel producer or for from a steel service center, they will order according to uh, standards. So, for instance, here. The, for uh, formable low carbon sheet steel, so not, uh, you know, we, um, we get, for instance, according to this uh, European normalization uh, of steel grades, we get these four grades, hmm? uh, DD11, DD12. Um, the D, as you remember, stands for um, draw, draw, the D from drawing, and the, the second D is, is not the H for hot roll, but it's, it stands for hot rolled. And the, the numbers here, 11, 12, uh, 13, and 14, don't mean anything. They're just, uh, the higher the number, the more formable the steel is, yes? And you can see that uh, the more formable steels have lower uh, carbon contents and also lower contents of magnesium, uh, excuse me, uh, manganese to, you know, to make the steel soft, yes? That's, that's the idea, formability. Uh, uh, traditionally is achieved through strength reduction hmm? and, 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 and working on the texture. Hmm? We'll see that that's not necessarily 
uh, the case uh, all the time, hmm? as we. Uh, so um, and, and also these um, uh, standards give us the mechanical properties, of course, because they're standards. They don't indicate a single <coughs> mechanical property for yield strength or tensile strength. They they give a range, yes, and very often this range is a little bit wide, yes. Yep. Uh, a little bit on the wide side. Um, so this is for the hot rolled grades here again. But you, you do see that as you uh, go from DD11 to DD14, from low to higher formability, you get a strength reduction. Hmm? Okay. Uh, uh, living in Asia, it's, it's uh, unlikely that you come across... Uh, um, European grade uh, uh, names, but um, you will come across the GIS grade, so there are equivalences, yes, and usually these uh, formable grades uh, uh, in the Japanese uh, standards go as SPHC, yes, and then the same as in uh, European. Uh, the last two, where you had the last two digits referring to an increasing uh, formability. Here you have the, the last uh, letters, the last letter of the, the standard that refers to the, um, the, the level of formability. Um, for instance, so, so the S, as you know, in GIS standards, stands, is the S of steel. Um, the uh, P stands for plain carbon steel, which, which is the same as saying low carbon steel. Mm -hmm. And uh, the H stands for hot rolling. In this case, it uh, makes sense. And then the C in this case stands for commercial quality grade, and D stands for uh, drawing quality grade, and uh, E stands for extra drawing quality grade. And, and to be honest, I don't know what F means. It stands for... Uh, <laughs> This morning, uh, but anyway, you can you get the idea, right? It's um, it's um, in uh, and again, you know, you also in the U.S. you have similar things with ASTM um, uh, uh, ASTM uh, standards. Okay. Now uh, these grades, uh, as you just saw, you can make them hot rolled grades or you can make them cold rolled grades, right? Uh, depending on, uh, you know, what your, um, uh, uh, the industry that uses these, the, the steel uh, is going to do with it. Um, if you, uh, uh, we look at the cold rolled grades, of course we don't have other, you know, uh, not a standard, yes? This is again for a uh, European standard. Here you have DCO, excuse me, DC, and then 01, 03, 04, 05, 06. Uh, the D stands for drawing, the C stands for cold rolling, the C of cold rolling, and then the 01, 03, 04, et cetera. That basically stands for, uh, it's just a, it just refers to the uh, higher level of formability. Hmm? And you see that, um, again, just as we saw for the hot rolled grades, um, uh, higher formability of DCO6 is achieved by having very low carbon contents, lower carbon content, and additions of titanium. Yes, you, you see that. Uh, so, so that means that of these four, uh, excuse me, five grades here, uh, only the DCO6, yes, is, is a titanium IF steel. So if your client orders a DCO6, yes, it must be in IF steel, yes? Because of the chemistry requirements. If, if, uh, your, your, uh, you can have a, a DCO5 with the same properties, yes? That's not an IF steel, yes? That's not an IF steel, yeah? So you could order, you, you, could, you could basically, uh, uh, this is, it's important, right? And the reason is, of course, why, why is this important? Well, it's because if you have an, an uh, IF steel, it's, it's non-aging. 
yes? You can keep it six months in storage, a year in storage, it, this will no, it will not age. In other words, your, um, your stress strain curves will not have uh, uh, looters plateaus or yield points, yes? That's very important. Mm -hmm. And again, um, uh, so, and this titanium, the standards uh, indicate that this titanium can be substituted by niobium to stabilize uh, carbon and nitrogen. Yeah. All right. So uh, if we look at the mechanical properties, uh, of course, as we go from DCO1 to DCO6, we reduce the, the yield strength considerably, yes, because of the uh, low carbon contents, if I may return, also a reduction of the manganese content, yes. Uh, we reduce the, the, the strength, and, and you can see here, yes, if you look here at the parameters that are related to formability, that's the elongation, the R value, hmm, the uh, normal anisotropy, and the N value, the uh, strain hardening coefficient, you see that they all increase, of course the elongation uh, also, uh, as, you, um, uh, as, as you get the softer material. Uh, the, the, uh, note that the standard also specifies in what direction the measurement has to be made and you know why it does this because the sheets have anisotropy right so you can you, you can measure very different values of R depending on the way you measure right so uh, it's agreed in the uh, in, in the, the standards that you always measured uh, 90 degrees to the rolling direction, yes? That's where the R value is highest, yes? Okay. Right, uh, again, um, w you have similar uh, types of um, uh, standards for uh, formable steels in, in, in the US, and, and here, for instance, according to the AS, this ASTM, you have this EDDS grade, which stands for extra deep drawing steel, yes, which is if you look at the uh, uh, niobium and uh, 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 titanium column, you can see that these are uh, must be. Uh, so if, if you get an order for EDDS steel, that steel must be an IF steel. Hmm? Okay, uh, and here you have mechanical properties again lower strength, higher formabilities. Hmm? Okay, uh, specifically um, uh, non ag uh, So here, um, a little bit uh, perhaps uh, useful uh, if you're ever uh, working in the industry is, is uh, how the uh, different grades correlate across the, the standards. Hmm? All right, so, um, Let's go back to this, uh, the, 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 the problem of formability and, and the fact that in both in the aluminum killed low carbon steels and in the IF steels, you achieve uh, uh, these very good forming properties by um, re basically removing carbon from solution, yes? So you know from uh, your classes in uh, introduction to material science that uh, usually when you try to in increase the strength of a material, yes, um, the plasticity as measured by, for instance, the elongation in a tensile test will, will decrease. Yeah? So that means it's, it's kind of... Uh, in other words, you know, uh, hard materials tend to be less ductile or not ductile at all, and, and very soft materials are much more ductile. So with these steels, which, which as you've seen uh, from the standards, what we're trying to do is improve elongation by making them softer. Yes? Okay? So we've made them very formable, but we've also made them very soft. So, um, so you can make a very nice part, 
yes? But if that part gets uh, damaged, uh, sorry, but that part can easily be damaged. And, and, and you know the this, this standard uh, well-known uh, problem is if you have a car body, yes? And uh, somebody uh, uh, hits your car body with, uh, you know, by opening a door or running a shopping cart into your car body, you get these dents, yes? And uh, very frustrating, yes? And the reason is, well, you know, it's soft because it's very formable, right? So um, there is, um, in these steels, there are variants, and one of the important variants in particular for this kind of application, what we call exterior panels, bake hardening is important to avoid these, these denting problems. Uh, and, and, and so, but you can already see what the problem will be. You know, uh, in order to avoid denting, I will need to make the material harder. So if I make it harder, it'll be less formable. So how is this solved? Well, there's a clever way to do this because when you make a, a car body part, um, the first thing that happens to the sheet, it goes through a, a press forming operation. You make the shape, yes? Uh, and, and so when you press form the material, it's at, it's at low temperature, so you basically work hardening the steel, yes? And work hardening is nothing else than, this slide is not, don't look for it, it's not in your, uh, 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 handouts. Um, the, um, it, then these parts get assembled, yes? And, uh, and then we apply a body coating. Hmm? Uh, usually many layers of this, and this, this paint is then cured. Yeah? But we, we call this paint baking, yes? And that is a thermal treatment. This, that is a thermal treatment. So you can use this, this thermal treatment to do the following. So if we, we now we look at the, the same process, but now from the side of, say, the physical metallurgy, yeah? if you have a, a piece of steel, yes, uh, you turn it into a part by, so the f deformation will give you work hardening, so you'll have an increase in strength as a consequence, yes? And if we look at the material, say we have a little bit of carbon, free carbon in solution in this material, yes? This uh, free carbon, yes, can interact with these dislocations formed during work hardening when, uh, when I do the paint baking. So you do the paint baking, yes? These dislocations will be pinned by the, uh, the carbon atoms and that will give you a yield point increase, yeah? As a consequence, a material which has a yield point at the time you do the pressing of 200 MPa, yes, may end up having a yield strength of 300 MPa when it's mounted in the car body. So much stronger material. Hmm? Right. So how does this work? Yeah, well, we already know that in order to achieve this, we will have to keep carbon in solution in the ferrite. And, uh, well, we know that solubility of carbon in ferrite is not very high. You see here the maximum solubility at this point is uh, slightly less than 200 ppm. And at room temperature, uh, it's very close to zero. Hmm? So we need to keep the carbon in solution. Hmm? This, this carbon, yes, um, interacts very strongly with dislocations, this interstitial carbon. Hmm? So it uh, say if we have a dislocation, a screw dislocation running here, yes, uh, the carbon at, uh, along, the screw dislocation will lie along one, one, one direction, yes. The carbon atoms can, can sit here in these interstitial, equivalent interstitial positions, yes. And, and um, in, um, maybe some of you have taken classes an introduction on uh, mechanical properties and already seen this topic. Um, and one of the things that um, is usually introduced is uh, the fact that um, 
In elementary theories of dislocation point defect interaction, carbon interaction uh, with dislocations, for instance, uh, it is said that oh, the interaction is, is purely of hydrostatic nature. Yes? So if, you, if your dislocation doesn't have a hydrostatic component, yes, there's going to be no interaction. And in other words, um, if you have an edge dislocation, yes, because of the added extra half plane here, you get lots of hydrostatic, hydrostatic pressure here. The material is in compression here. Whereas here, it's because of the missing plane, it's in hydrostatic tension. Yeah? And so there's going to be a very strong uh, 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 relation, possibility, for carbon to be attracted to this region hmm, because of the um, lattice expansion uh, related to carbon. Hmm. Um, so, so this theory then says, well, there cannot be any uh, interaction between carbon atoms and, for instance, and screw dislocation. That's not correct because uh, well, it doesn't apply here because uh, our, the, the, first of all, carbon doesn't give you uh, a um, spherical lattice distortion, but an asymmetric elliptical lattice distortion, and it can interact very strongly with, uh, with dislocations of any kind, whether they are screws or edges or mixed. Yeah? So um, very strong interaction between uh, dislocations and uh, screw dislocations, yes? Uh, so what you can think of, yeah, is that um, uh, what I explained here is that if, if we're thinking about a, an edge dislocation, so on if this is the, the edge dislocation here, it's projected, yeah, the slip plane is projected here. Um, uh, in the, uh, above the uh, slip plane, there's compression. At the bottom, there is a, uh, a tension, yes? and, and so the carbon atoms will, f will group here and form what we call a uh, a, a, an atmosphere that pins the um, the um, the dislocation. Yeah? And, and the, the pinning is it's what it is, and not really a physical pinning. What what basically is is that the strain field, yes, of the carbon atoms and of the uh, dislocation is reduced by the interaction, right? Okay. Now, it's a little, yeah, so that's point number one. Um, but um, when, when you have carbon, yes, uh, the interstitials, uh, they can do many more things than just go to the dislocations. Yes? The carbon atoms can go to uh, grain boundaries. We'll talk about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, or they can, uh, they can form carbides. Um, now, uh, we know that in order to form carbides, you, you need some kind of diffusion. Hmm? And um, so, and the, the kinetics also of the um, carbide formation and the formation of uh, uh, Cottrell atmospheres may not be the same necessarily. And, and that's actually the case. If, um, so if, if you take uh, ferrite at higher temperature, for instance, uh, say 700 degrees C, where there's lots of carbon in solution, where you can get, and you go to room temperature, yeah, the carbon is supersaturated solution, right? So, so it can do many things. It can go to dislocations. It can, it can form, it may form carbides, question mark, yeah? Uh, and uh, and it can go to grain boundaries, yeah? yes. and these processes are you know, have different kinetics. Yes, there's there's a lot a very high driving force to to do any of these things, any of three, uh, but the kinetics will be different. And um, so so people have you know again as it's physical metallurgy, I'm, I'm not going to go into this, but people have done this, and. Uh, found that the, uh, the kinetics, so 
if this is the carbon content in solution as a function of time and temperature, um, there is a separate uh, kinetics for the formation of carbon atmospheres and that's different from the formation of carbide precipitates. Yes? And the, so the, uh, uh, and, and this is the, the, the law, it's a, uh, uh, one over exponent, exponential minus T over tau one and that to the power two thirds. So, so this is important is for the formation of carbon atmospheres we have a two to the two thirds law and we have a three halves law for the formation of carbides. Uh, what it basically means is that, excuse me, is that the carbide formation always follows the atmosphere formation. Yes? So they don't happen at the same time. There's always first there will be formation of atmospheres, then there will be formation of uh, precipitates. And we'll see that, what the effect is of this in... Um, so, it, uh, so, so the, the kinetics uh, of the carbon diffusion to uh, dislocation looks like this. You, you can represent it like uh, in, in this form. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one minus the, the, the ratio of uh, carbon in solution, yes, uh, divided by the... Uh, the, the starting amount of carbon in solution, yes? And, and what you find is uh, as a function of the temperature to the two thirds, yes? You, you find in a log, log, uh, uh, a log plot, you find straight lines, yes? And you see that as I increase the, 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 the temperature, yes? Uh, the slope is increased. That's because of the diffusivity. Uh, increasing. Uh, and, and you can see here uh, that it, it does, you know, uh, I would have to uh, recalculate this in, um, in normal uh, time values here, but um, let me put it this way, it doesn't take very long, yes, for the, um, the carbon to almost fully go to uh, form, uh, to, to fully um, saturate the uh, atmospheres that are available um, at, at relatively low temperature, hmm? because we're talking here um, of relatively low temperatures. Hmm? Uh, by the way, the, bake, the paint baking is done at temperatures between 150 to 200 degrees C. Hmm? Hmm? Now, what about the, the, uh, the kinetics of uh, the carbide formations. Well, what uh, what is the situation? So, so it's a, it's a precipitate. So uh, with precipitates, you have to look at precipitation time temperature uh, diagram. So you have the temperature on this axis, y axis, the time on the y axis, mm -hmm. and what you see is that there is a C curve for the Fe3C, and there is another C curve for what are called transition carbides. Yes, and if uh, I remind you of the fact that the uh, bake hardening is done at around 200 degrees C, you can see that the carbide that we're going to get at low temperature is not going to be Fe3C, yes, but it's going to be a transition carbide. Yes, what is a transition carbide? Well, it's, it's, it's basically a carbide that's not in your phase diagram. You know, in your phase diagram you get cementite, Fe3C, yes? And uh, a transition carbide is, is, a pr is a low temperature precursor to the, uh, the high uh, stability uh, cementite. Um, uh, but that's, that's the one, that's the kind of carbides that are formed uh, initially when carbon precipitates as a, yeah? and, uh, you may be familiar with uh, uh, the name epsilon carbide or eta carbide. Uh, that those are the names for these uh, transition carbides. Uh, 
Right. So um, if we um, if if we look at the precipitates of uh, the uh, precipitation or dissolution of carbides, yes, a uh, number of interesting things uh, to know. Hmm? So uh, if you look at the uh, the carbon uh, the growth of a uh, particle, hmm? uh, what is um, what we, f we find out is that the growth is very much controlled by the diffusion profile here, Diffu the carbon diffusion profile around the particle. Yes, yes. So uh, if you have a, a particle at a certain time, and the, if you make a snapshot at uh, a certain time dt later, it's grown, yes, and the growth has been generated by the flux of carbon towards the, the original particle. So uh, you can basically um, do the math, yes, um, it's in textbooks, I, I'm not going to uh, go into this, but when you do this, hmm, you see that uh, you find this equation here for the change of the radius of the particle as a function of temperature and time, yes, and uh, so it goes as the square root of the, the time, yes, and it also goes as the square root of the carbon diffusion uh, diffusivity, and if you use this, the radius, to calculate the volume of the particle, you, you now find that uh, as a result of the um, sim simply using the uh, d this this well known equation here right uh, for the volume uh, you find now that the particle growth kinetics go as t to the three halves mm -hmm. so growth of particles um, uh, goes as uh, three halves. Okay, I'm not going to go into this, uh, but what is important to see is these uh, particles, uh, the growth of uh, cementite, for instance, from supersaturated ferrite, that it's quite rapid. Yes, it's quite rapid. Hmm? This is here an overaging the calculation. You see that uh, uh, the particle easily increases. Uh, in radius about tenfold, with tenfold in size, yes, um, within, um, um, you know, about seven minutes, yes. So, and that's typically the time we take for overaging steels, for instance. Remember that we, in the overaging continuous annealing, we do some overaging to precipitate the carbon. Well, uh, you see that, uh, and, and it's typically at this temperature that we do this, that you know, the growth of the particles, cementite particles, and the, the re removal of carbon from solution is quite effective. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because it's not of uh, great use, and let's just um, focus on, on uh, the, the two following slides. Um, now, the problem is, um, how, how do we make a bake hardenable steel? Yes? How do we make a bake hardenable steel? Uh, first of all, um, the amount of carbon that we need to saturate the Cottrell atmospheres yes? in a press hardened part is not very hot. We need about less than 10 ppm of carbon. Yes? 10 ppm. Uh, and at that level of carbon, yes, the steel is in principle aging. It's, it's right, because there's free carbon in the steel, so it's an aging grade. However, the aging is extremely minimal, right? So 
that is what one tries to do. Yes? With the big Harnabel grades, you use these concepts, yes? But you try to control the amount of carbon in solution to around this level. Okay? So let's see how that is being done in practice. Hmm? Well, for the um, uh, low carbon steels, for these ones, aluminum killed low carbon steels, we have typically uh, this range of uh, carbon contents, yes? And so you know that if we want to make them uh, to have a very low aging uh, level, we uh, do recrystallization annealing of the cold roll strip. <coughs> 800 degrees C, we develop the texture there, and then we cool the material. We don't go right away to room temperature, but we stop, yes, to start the precipitation of cementite and decrease the solute carbon in the process, yes? Well, it's very simple. You can keep 10 ppm in solution if you just control the length of this, uh, this segment. Yes? You can keep your uh, some small amount of carbon in solution. How about the the IF steels? Hmm? Well, first, um, we ne I need to say something about the relative stability of carbides. Yes? In titanium IF steels, yes? we tend to add a rather large amount of titanium, yes? So the titanium carbide hmm, uh, is, is difficult to put in solution, yeah? So once you've precipitated titanium carbide, you really need to go very high soaking or reheating temperatures to put the titanium carbide back in solution. Because normally we add what's called a large excess of titanium to force the titanium carbide to form. Mm -hmm. so in the case of niobium titanium IF steels, it's not the case. We add exact stoichiometric amounts of niobium. So the, if, if you look at the niobium over carbon ratio, atomic ratio, yeah, it's about one in these steels. In this case, the titanium over carbon atomic ratio is larger than one substantially larger than one. So, big hardening approach number one, you use this steel, yes? And what do you do? Hmm? So, this is your phase diagram. Um, the amount of um, carbon is, is very low, yes? Uh, so this is 100 ppm, this is 500 ppm and the carbon levels will be around here, right? Yeah. So what do, what do we do? Hmm? Uh, so we make this steel, we cold roll it, and then we bring it into uh, our annealing furnace, continuous annealing furnace, where we have in, uh, niobium carbides. You can, in principle, you can use the same process with titanium carbide, but it's, it's usually not being done for the reason that I said, namely the, the larger stability of the titanium carbide. Uh, you heat up, yes, and then you go to slightly higher soaking temperatures. And what happens there? The niobium carbide goes back into solution, yes? So in a controlled way, so you can cool down now some of the niobium carbide uh, recombines, yes? And then you do rapid cooling, yeah? 
It doesn't fully recombine, and you're left with solute carbon. Ver again, very small amounts, yes? So, um, is there another possibility? Yes, there is another possibility, and that would work for this one here. Yes? If you have extremely low carbon content, if, if, you, if you can achieve close to this amount of carbon yes, in, your, in your steel, then just leave it there, right? Don't do anything about it. So use a titanium IF steel where only the titanium nitride is stabilized, the, this nitrogen is stabilized, yes? Uh, and you're basically making what's called an ultra-low carbon steel, yes? So in this case, uh, you have very, very low uh, carbon contents. Of course, it's, it's super saturation because the, the, uh, the solubility of carbon is, is close to zero at room temperature. Um, and, and so when you, you reheat, you get grain growth and, and, and texture. The carbon stays in solution, and when you cool down, the carbon is always in solution. But again, extremely low levels of carbon. So, um, uh, so for bake hardening, less than 10 ppm of carbon in solution, yes, is, is enough. Yes? So I can do either an aluminum killed low carbon grade bake hardening by controlling the overaging. That's one way. Second way, it's use a titanium niobium, IF steel. We still call them IF steels. Um, and uh, do a niobium carbide dissolution. Yeah. Or the third one is I use a ultra low carbon steel. Yes, ultra low carbon steels, uh, which is titanium added, but where the titanium only uh, stabilizes the nitrogen. Uh, just, just uh, well. How long would it take us, for instance, to dissolve the niobium carbide particle in a uh, in a big hardened steel, which contains 150 ppm of niobium and 20 ppm of of uh, carbon? Hmm? So we have a precipitate here, niobium carbide, that dissolves in surrounding ferrite. Yes. Okay. And so uh, around the particle, there is a niobium. Uh, diffusion profile, yes, and, and, and this is the, the, the one that drives the, the solution, right? And so, and we can calculate uh, uh, the dissolution, yes? So we look at the particle radius, we start particle radius and uh, of one micron here, for instance, and we wonder how long will it take for this particle to disappear at a soaking temperature of 800, yes? And it takes me 150 seconds, yes? So less, less than three, three minutes, okay? To dissolve that particle. The low carbon steels, uh, IF steels, big hardenable steels are very boring. There's nothing to see. Just ferrite grains, basically. Yeah. Uh, of course, you can change the grain size. Yeah. Uh, you get to change in, in properties, as you know. Um, but if you look at the mechanical properties, in particular for the bake hardening, you, you get very, very different, uh, very interesting development of the properties. So let's have a look at these bake hardening steels, for instance, in terms of mechanical properties. For big hardening steels, remember, we're only interested in yielding, right? Not, and when you make a dent in a car, these are very, very small strains, yes? Uh, yeah, so, um, so if you take a big hardenable steel and you, you strain it, you make a deformation, yeah? Deformation that is typically given in press forming for outer parts, a few percents of strain. So here uh, we did 5%. So you, you can see that when you pre-strain, there is no uh, yield point. 
in that big hardener built grade. Shouldn't have any yield point. Yeah? So you and then you stop the deformation at this at five percent of strain. Yes, and at and and so uh, uh, at, at this uh, stress level. Okay. Now you take that same material and you go through a aging process and the aging process uh, that is used typically to test big hardening is you uh, you keep the material for 20 minutes at 170 degrees C yes that that mimics the uh, the paint baking process hmm? and and then your uh, so when you redo on the same material this the same pre-strained material, the stress-strain curve, this is what you find. There is now a yield point, yes, and uh, there's been an increase here, an increase in the, in the strength. So the, the strength was at this level, now it's at this level. Hmm? And a yield point elongation. Yeah? So, and if you plot this yield point increase of uh, yield uh, strength as a function of the aging time, for instance, this is at 50 degrees C, so at, at relatively low temperatures, yeah, you find that it goes like this, then there is a slightly uh, flat region, and then you have increasing again, and then you have a decrease, a slight decrease here. So what we get are different stages of the precipitation process. So the first process, which gives us by far the most hardening, yes, is the atmosphere stage formation. The next one is these groups of atoms will form low temperature transition carbides, yes, and if you wait long enough, this is a very long time, yes, uh, 10,000 seconds, or 10,000 minutes, excuse me, you, s you start seeing the precipitate coarsening, yes? Okay. Uh, how much can you expect in terms of strength increase? Well, you see it here, of the order of 30, maybe 40 megapascal. But that's already considerable. So is that the end of the story? And are the things that simple? Yes and no. Uh, um, remember the microstructure I showed you, you know, and I said it's not very interesting, uh, but there's one thing in this microstructure that also captures carbon atoms, and those are the grain boundaries. So the grain size will have an impact on the bake hardening behavior because it's also a sink for carbon. Hmm? And if um, it's a sink for carbon, and if and the, and and uh, the grain boundaries uh, attract carbon atoms. Hmm? So let's have a look at um, what how carbon distributes itself between uh, being in, uh, dissolved, being at the grain boundary, or being uh, at these locations. Hmm? So. So the process of bake hardening, again, uh, you start with the continuous annealing, right? So this is continuous annealing uh, cycle. So this, so this is the thermal, here on the left is this thermal cycle. I plot temperature versus time. This is my continuous annealing cycle, yes? My overaging, and then I cool down. The pre-straining happens at room temperature, of course, in terms of uh, uh, thermal history is nothing happening, but of course the pre-straining gives me what? A very high increase in the dislocation density, right? Don't forget that. Here I have low dislocation density. After the pre-straining, I have dislocations, right? And then the bake hardening is a low temperature and rather long, 20-minute yeah, uh, uh, hold. So what do we get in terms of so we have, carbon will always be in one of the three situations. Eh? It can be in solution, carbon uh, in solution. 
carbon at the grain boundaries or at the dislocations. So what, what do we see? Yeah? So at the very beginning, yeah, the material as we get it, yes, uh, before continuous annealing, actually most of the carbon is in grain boundaries. Yeah? Uh, and as we heat it, yes, it leaves the grain boundaries. Why would they do that? Because the solubility increases, yes. Yes. And we see an increase in the solute carbon content. Yes. And as the temperature decreases here, yes, we see a decrease in the amount of carbon in uh, solution and the carbon here in uh, grain boundary increases. Hmm? Then uh, when we do the deformation, at room temperature, nothing happens because it's room temperature, not, no, not much diffusion, yes? But at the end of the deformation, we get a very high dislocation density, yes? Very high dislocation density, and, uh, and when we do the low temperature annealing, we do see a slight increase in the carbon at the grain boundaries, but most of the carbon goes into forming uh, Cottrell atmospheres, hmm? doing what it's supposed to do for bake hardening. Okay? So, um, you know, very careful if you're ever uh, uh, looking at aging phenomena, yes, uh, that um, the, uh, the, the, the carbon has different uh, places where it can go. It doesn't only form uh, uh, atmospheres. And in this particular calculation, of course, you, um, uh, you will have noticed that this calculation is, is only for a very, very ultra-low carbon steel, for the ultra-low carbon steel. So that's, that would be this one here. Hmm? Because I, I assumed that we ne here we didn't form carbides. Yes? So if you form carbides, it becomes you know, slightly more uh, complex, even more complex, okay? Because this would be the situation. Where, yeah? Right, so these are typical composition for a big hardening steels, uh, some processing parameters here. You can see here, uh, this would be uh, a version where we have uh, 29 ppm of carbon, uh, some nitrogen here, uh, sorry, excuse me, titanium to stabilize the nitrogen, yes, and most of, uh, and, and then niobium is added because we are making this type of uh, big hardenable steel, a titanium niobium big hardenable steel. Hmm? The, uh, the big hardening uh, is the value is about uh, uh, 50, uh, this is an example here, a, a typical example for a BH steel with, with this value and these processing conditions, about 50 MPa. You will see that this is BH2. The two here refers to the fact that this is after price straining of 2%. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like you're doing a, a standard test where you assume the panel that you're deforming is, has an average deformation of 2% and, and you, you look at the aging, the increase in the, the yield strength uh, after um, a strain of 2%. Hmm? Hmm? Sometimes in standards and in, in practice you also see people referring to BH0, yes? BH0, right, rather than BH2. When you measure the BH0, you, you're basically comparing what is the, uh, the yield strength before. So that you take a stress strain curve, uh, stress strain curve, you determine the yield strength, and then you age the material. Yes, you take a second sample, you age it. Yes, and you do the test, and then you find this yield strength, and, and, and this is called then 
the big hardening value, the increase in the strength. So that's different. The BH2, what you do is first you do a pre-strain. Yes, you determine the flow stress here. Yes. Um, so so you, you have added already work hardening. And then you do, on the same specimen, you, re you do an aging and you repeat the uh, straining. In, in this case, your yield point is there, and it's, this is your big hardening. So it's important to realize that your, the increase in the yield strength from the original material to the, uh, to the situation after pre-straining and big hardening contains a work hardening plus aging effect, right? So this work hardening effect has to be removed, yes? If you, uh, if you do the measurements. Okay, and, and so here, um, again, I'm, I'm, uh, this is one of these lists where I'm not going to go through it. Uh, and it's of interest, maybe of interest to you, is just standards of about bake hardening. And you can see here, uh, what types of values you get and there is some data in your notes for um, European uh, and for North American uh, uh, bake hardening grades. Okay. Right, so these uh, steels that we talked about um, Aluminum kilt, titanium IF, uh, and other IF steels. Again, uh, they work because we want formable steel, and so we do low strength. Yes, but obvious question is, and it was the case with bake hardening. I showed you an example, right? Uh, you know, you want to avoid denting. Yes, but there are cases, other cases where. You just want a material that's stronger, yes? How, how do you do this? Yeah. Well, uh, the uh, next step where you try to keep the microstructure that gives you this very good formability, uh, this texture, yeah, but you're going to add very small amounts of elements to give you strength. Now, and it, what's, what's the obvious choice? Well, solid solution hardening, right? You just add uh, strong solid solution hardeners to your ferrite, yes, in small amounts, yes, so that you can get strength without uh, touching too much formability. And so here you see what is the effect of adding phosphorus, manganese, silicon, etc to ferrite, yes, uh, and what's the effect on the yield strength tensile strength? And of course we already know uh, uh, from our st strengthening mechanism that uh, class that phosphorus, manganese, and silicon will give us the best hardening, yes. And you can see that 100, <coughs> excuse me, ppm of phosphorus gives you about uh, 12 in megapascal increase in strength. So if I add a thousand, yes, hmm, I, I will have a hundred MPA extra, hmm, and a, a thousand um, ppm of carbon is 0.1 percent. So it's, it's we're not talking about yes, uh, manganese, silicon, um, and copper. Hmm? So these are probably the four elements that we think about when we want to do the strengthening contribution. And phosphorus is a manganese and silicon are, are very common elements that we add. Hmm? So, for instance, here uh, a number of uh, grades that use this yes, uh, effect. Uh, we call them refos grades because, as you know, uh, in general we don't like to have too much phosphorus in our steels because of the effect the phosphorus has on grain boundary cohesion strength, yes, uh, but um, 
if we want if if we want to add a controlled amount of phosphorus for strength, uh, we, we we're talking about the refos grades, and and the, these are typical values of um, of phosphorus additions. Yes. Okay. Um, typical strength values. You can see here uh, uh, that you get uh, values which are all uh, higher than, close or higher than 300 megapascal for the yield uh, values. Uh, you still get very nice elongations, so the formability of the material is guaranteed. Yes, And uh, these are a number of other uh, um, standards according to ASTM and some uh, so you can have a look at this so one of the the problems uh, as I said of the the phosphorus is that you uh, uh, you uh, weaken the grain boundaries yes there's one uh, situation that exists in IF steels is that when you add phosphorus to IF steels to make them stronger, yes, the, the, you weaken the grain boundaries, yes? And you get a problem called uh, secondary work embrittlement. So it means if you, you make something apart, yes, and you deform it again, that happens very often in press forming. The, the, the part goes through a number of steps, forming steps. So you form it, and then you deform it slightly more afterwards, you can get brittle fracture. And that's because you've weakened the grain boundaries, yes? The problem is, well, the phosphorus goes to your grain boundaries, yes? In, in the IF steels, you see, an aluminum killed low carbon steels, if this is a grain boundary in an IF steel, if this is the same grain boundary, in the low carbon aluminum killed low carbon steel, there's always carbon at the grain boundaries. Yes? So the phosphorus cannot go to the grain boundaries. In the case of the IF steels, you do a refos addition, you the phosphorus will go and sit at the grain boundaries, yes? and allowing the grain boundaries to split eventually. So um, luckily, um, well, we can do two things. We can add, add carbon again, but then, you know, that's the reason why we're not using carbon is to have the high formability, which we want to keep. So what we do is, uh, in order to avoid this, yes, we use boron. We make small additions of boron, yes, and the boron is just like carbon, likes to go to grain boundaries, yes, likes to go to grain boundaries, and... When it does that, the phosphorus has no uh, chance of uh, going and sit at, on the grain boundary sites because the, the binding energy for uh, boron to go to the grain boundary is larger than that for, for phosphorus. Yeah? So, okay. Right, so we'll uh, continue uh, with the... Um, the, the, the problem of um, higher strength and formability um, next time we meet. Thank you very much. For